can hear you. Thank you very much. One minute to go, honorable members. Uh, we have got here. Good morning, everyone, and very welcome to this meeting. This is the meeting of the Portfolio Committee on Health of the National Assembly on the virtual, on the virtual platform. It is the 9th of November 2022. We will be discussing uh, or deliberating on the last three clauses of the NHI bill. Those are clauses 57 to 59. And again, you are all very welcome. Ms. Majalamba, can you give us an indication of attendance and apologies, please? Good morning, and thank you, Chair. Present is Dr. Jacobs, Mr. Munyai, Ms. Gela, Dr. Harvard, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Ishmael, Dr. Tembeguayo, and Mr. Van Staden. I've received an apology from Ms. Sukers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I know that Mr. Hutler is uh, not sorry, here. Sorry, Chairperson. Can I also record the apology of Honorable Naledi Chiron? Thank you. Noted. I also know that Mr. Hutler is not here. We normally introduce the members from the department. I see the DDG, Dr. Nicholas Chris, uh, on the platform. Can you please indicate who is here from the department? Yeah, good morning. Uh, honorable chair and honorable members thank you very much um so present in the meeting this is here so it's myself ddg national health insurance and i see mr andre fenter from our finance and former cfo is on the platform um i'm sure i'm going to be joined shortly by others Ms. meryl buerta is also here also from um been working with us on the financing we will shortly be joined by others. We've had a range of meetings this morning, so I apologize that we're joining later. Thank you. Thank you. The state law advisors. I also did not see them on the platform. They are not in the platform, Chief. I note uh, Dr. Kwaina Chulare from the department also. Mr. Ann Isaac? Uh, thank you, Chair. I am present in the meeting. Thank you from the Parliamentary Legal Services. Honorable members, we will continue with our work. And uh, I'm still hoping that the state law advisors will join us. Just give me a short moment. Thank you. Um, I just need to read uh, the rules of the meeting. Before we proceed, we'd like to remind you that this virtual meeting is deemed to be in the precinct of parliament and therefore constitutes a meeting of a committee of the National Assembly for official purposes only. In addition to the rules, of virtual sitting, the rules of National Assembly, including the rules of debate apply. Members enjoy the same powers and privileges that apply in the sitting of the National Assembly. Members should equally note that anything said in the virtual platform is deemed to have been said to the House and may be ruled upon. All members of long in shall be considered to be present and are requested to mute their microphones and only unmute when they recognize to speak. This is because the microphones are very sensitive and will pick up noise which might disturb the attention of other members. When recognized to speak, please unmute your microphone and connect your video. Members may make use of the icons on the bar at the bottom of their screens, which has an option that allows a member to put a piece of hand to raise points of order. The secretariat will assist in alerting the chairperson to members requesting to speak. When using the virtual system, members are urged to refrain or desist from unnecessary points of order or interjections. 
We will now continue, honorable members, with the uh, clause 57. And I just have to switch my uh, platform here. I'm going to read clause uh, 57, and then afterwards we'll have some deliberations on this clause. The uh, heading is transitional arrangements. Despite anything to the contrary in this act, this act must be implemented over two phases. National health insurance must be gradually phased in using a progressive and programmatic approach based on financial resource availability. The two phases contemplated in subsection 1A are as follows. A phase one for a period of five years from 2070 to 2022, which must continue with the implementation of health system strengthening initiatives, including alignment of human resources with that which may be required by users of the fund. Include the development of national health insurance legislation and amendments to other legislation. Include the undertaking of initiatives which are aimed at establishing institutions that must be the foundation for a fully functional fund and include the purchasing of personal health care services for vulnerable groups such as children, women, people with disabilities and the elderly. And phase two must be for a period of four years from 2022 to 2026 and which must include the continuation of health system strengthening initiatives on an ongoing basis, the mobilization of additional resources where necessary, and the selective contracting of healthcare services from private providers. In phase one, the minister may establish the following interim committees to advise him or her on the implementation of the national health insurance. The National Tertiary Health Services Committee, which must be responsible for developing the framework governing the tertiary services platform in South Africa. The national governing body of training and development, which must, among others, be responsible for advising the minister on the vision for health workforce matters, for recommending policy related to health sciences, student education and training, including a human resource for health development plan. Be responsible for the determination of the number and placement of, including but not limited to all categories of interns, community service, and registrars. Oversee and monitor the implementation of the policy and evaluate its impact, and coordinate and align strategic policy and financing of health sciences education. The Ministerial Advisory Committee on Healthcare Benefits for National Health Insurance must be a precursor to the Benefits Advisory Committee and which must advise the Minister on a process of priority setting to inform the decision-making processes of the fund to determine the benefits to be covered. The Ministerial Advisory Committee on Health Technology Assessment for National Health Insurance, which must be established to advise the Minister on Health Technology Assessment, and which must serve as a precursor to the Health Technology Assessment Agency that must regularly review the range of health interventions and technology by using the best available evidence on cost effectiveness, allocative, productive, and technical efficiency and health technology assessment. Objectives that must be phased, must, must be achieved in phase one include the migration of central hospitals that are funded, governed, and managed nationally as semi-autonomous entities, the structuring of the contracting unit for primary healthcare at district level in a cooperative management arrangement with the district hospital linked to a number of primary healthcare facilities, the establishment of the fund, including the establishment of governance structures. The development of a health patient registration system contemplated in Section 5. The process for the accreditation of healthcare service providers, which must require that health establishments are inspected and certified by the Office of Health Standards Compliance. 
health professionals are licensed by the respective statutory bodies and healthcare service providers comply with criteria for accreditation. The purchasing of healthcare service benefits, which include personal health services, such as primary health care services, maternity and child health care services, including school health services, health care services for the agent, people with disabilities and rural communities, from contracted public and private providers, including general practitioners, audiologists, oral health practitioners, optometrists, speech therapists and other designated providers, at a primary health care level, focusing on disease prevention, health promotion, provision of primary health care services, and addressing critical backlogs. The purchasing of health services and other clinical support services, which must be funded by the fund, an expansion of the personal health services purchased, and from higher level levels of care from public hospitals, central, tertiary, regional, and district hospitals including emergency medical services and pathology services provided by the National Health Authority Services and the initiation of legislative reforms in order to enable the introduction of national health insurers, including changes to the Medicines and Related Substances Act 1965, Act Number 101 of 1965, Occupational Diseases in Mines and Works 1973, which is Act Number 78, of 1973, Health Professions Act 1974, which is Act Number 56 of 1974, Dental Technicians Act 1979, which is Act Number 19 of 1979, Allied Health Professions Act 1982, which is Act Number 63 of 1982, Medical Schemes Act 1998, which is Act Number 131 of 1998, Mental Health Care Act 2002, which is Act Number 17 of 2002, National Health Act, Nursing Act 2005, which is Act Number 33 of 2005, Traditional Health Practitioners Act 2007, which is Act Number 22 of 2007, and other relevant acts. Objectives that were first be achieved in phase two include the establishment and opera, opera, <laughs> operationalization of the fund as a purchase of healthcare services for a system of mandatory repayment. Honorable members, I'm going to request your indulgence a little bit because I am using, because we have a virtual system, I have to switch between uh, windows. So your indulgence will be requested. I'm going to take the following hands. Wilson. Van Staden. Gela. Clark. Seawella. Munyai, any other hands? Howard? Please note me, Chair. Ismail. Tembaquayo. I'm going to repeat. Wilson, Pansar, and Gela, Clark, Simwela, Munyai. Harvard, East Mountain, McGuire. In that order, honorable members. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, and I, I thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to be first. I have a very serious matter that I need to go and deal with. Um, so dealing in, in clause number 57, well, quite frankly, clause number 57 throws this entire bill right out of the window. Um, you know, phase phase one was supposed to be implemented from 2017 to 2022. We are at the end of 2022. Um, you can't have a bill with this kind of with this kind of information in it passing. Um, you can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. Phase two was supposed to start in from 2022 to 2026. 
at this stage, phase one will not even have been, been started by 2026. Um, there is just absolutely no ways that this bill, until such time as this entire section is amended, can even be remotely considered. Um, you, you can't pass a bill that is, that is so far out of these time frames. It's just absolutely impossible. Um, and, you know, there's a whole lot of things. I mean, let's take uh, 57.3. The min minister may establish the foreign inter interim committees um, to advise him or her on the implementation of the national health insurance. Not one of those, those setups has been established. Um, the uh, 57.4c, the establishment of a fund, including the establishment of governance structures that falls into phase one. And yet, in phase two, um, there's a section, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find it. Okay, so the establishment of a fund. We have no idea how that fund is going to be established, how it is going to be funded, where the money is going to come from, what it is going to cost. Um, and we can't even consider this bill until such time as we get that kind of information. It talks about the process for the accreditation of healthcare service providers, um, which which must require that health establishments are inspected and certified by the Office of the Health Standards Compliant. Health professionals are licensed by the respective statutory bodies and healthcare service providers comply with the accreditation criteria for accreditation. Well, quite frankly, after our visit to the Eastern Cape this, this weekend, not one of those facilities will even come close to accreditation. In actual fact, they should have been closed down there in such a bad state. Um, and that's just four out of an entire country. Um, and, and, and the health ombudsman said that with the current state of, of the health facilities and the fact that they won't at this stage cannot meet criteria to be accredited, um, we can't even consider NHI. And then I just, you know, again, 57, oh, sorry, for G1, um, the purchasing of hospital services and other clinical su support, support services, which one must be funded by the fund, funded by which fund? There is no fund. There is no money. And right now we are so busy trying to pay medical legal claims that we are not going to be able to establish that fund. You cannot ask people to pay monies into a fund that is going to pay the medical legal claims of disastrous facilities um, at the expense of the taxpayers, not the taxpayers problem. And we cannot, the money from this fund, that's where it's going to go. We can't allow that. And in the H, there are a whole string of acts or bills that need to be amended. Um, and, and, you know, this is hugely problematic. We cannot just sit here and say, oh, we're going to just amend those bills um, to make them compliant with the NHI. It doesn't work that way. Those bills and acts have to go through procedures. They have to be um, subject to public scrutiny. They have to, we have to have inputs from stakeholders. Um, this just can't be A-listed or B-listed and, and swept under the carpet. It's not going to be allowed to happen. Um, and then it, it, your, your very last one, five objectives must be achieved in phase, objectives that must be achieved in phase two include the establishment or operization, operas, opera, uh, that was just running off my tongue, of the fund as a purchaser of health services through a system of mandatory payment. You've got it in phase one and you've got it in phase two. When is it supposed to be happen? How is it supposed to happen? Um, Quite frankly, Chair, this entire entire section, um, as it is written with its current time frames, um, is, is as far as I'm concerned, just thrown this entire bill out of the window. It cannot even be considered until such time as all the various amendments are made. Um, and under no circumstances can we pass a bill that is dealing with these kind of time frames. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, deliberate on 57 to A and B and 4 E and um, H uh, in my comments. I also have a concern on the timelines, uh, which is connected in this bill into certain phases. 
Um, in my opinion, timelines cannot be linked to this both implementation because government will never be successful in the implementation of the NHI then. And timelines uh, are never met and are constantly missed and moved and are already, this is already behind schedule. And in terms of 11 amendments or those 11 laws that must be uh, done, public, the, we must remember that the public participation framework must be adhered to in this process. Um, these polls cannot just be amended, there's a process that, that must be followed. My comments on the other sections are as follows. Um, if a South African, government, South African government was generally concerned about its citizens, uh, honorable chairperson, and the medical well being, it would first have ensured uh, that South Africa's existing state hospitals and clinics are turned around and fully upgraded before it came up with a system like the NHI. And I think we saw this past weekend what is happening on ground level. Uh, this bill will surely provide government with the power to decide what treatment the patient will need, who will provide the treatment, and, and where a patient should get such a treatment. The NHI is, in our view, clearly not sustainable and should be abolished with immediate effect, and I've said it many times in Parliament also. At present, and on the one hand, South Africa has a public healthcare sector that has a footprint in even the smallest of settlements, but it is characterized by inadequate supplies and the lack of expertise. On the other hand, the private healthcare sector maintains world-class standards. The biggest challenge in our healthcare is a lack of expertise. Management and corruption, uh, sorry, mismanagement and corruption have destroyed the public healthcare institutions. The government's obsession with transformation means that even more expertise is forced out of the sector, and so much so that thousands of, thousands of our healthcare practic practitioners are working uh, abroad and threatened to leave the country when the NHI is coming into effect. So in our view, cooperation must be established between the public and private healthcare sectors so that expertise, expert, expertise and facilities can be shared. The main objective must not be transformation, but good accessible healthcare for all citizens. Um, sound management practices must be implemented at all hospitals and clinics, and only people with managerial experience must be appointed as chief executive of officers at hospitals. The Freedom Front Plus condemns the overregulation of the medical aid industry, whereby the funds are taxed excessively and the net tax burden on individuals is increased. The medical aid industry and private medical service industry are crucial partners in offering good quality healthcare services in South Africa. We should rather endeavor to establish a national partnership between private and public medical services what, that will allow enough leeway for both of these sectors to function without any unnecessary restrictions in the interest of a healthier population. Thus, the process of implementing the NHI must be determined. And our point of view, as you know, is that first upgrade public healthcare infrastructure and appoint experts and stop the overregulation of the medical aid industry. Lastly, the government must indicate how it plans to turn around the Department of Health and how it will save the department from sinking even deeper into the pit of corruption and poor service delivery. The government needs to indicate how it plans to improve the terrible conditions in state hospitals and clinics as well. In addition, government must also explain what it's going to do to ensure that medical staff members who do not care for patients as for or to or who even assault patients as we have seen previous years in hospitals and clinics are held accountable. Further high level investigations must be conducted into the numerous deaths in state hospitals and the strange circumstances under which these deaths occurred. South Africa state hospitals and clinics are in a terrible condition and service delivery is extremely poor. That places immense pressure on nursing staff and doctors who have to get by with inadequate equipment and medicine. Now, as I've said, South Africa's healthcare system is in a deep pit, not due to a lack of funds, but due to mismanagement, corruption and incompetence. Government is now expecting the very same officials who are responsible for the current chaos to manage in grandiose in its eye. It's obviously doomed to fail. I must remind you, Chair, that in July 2019, only 60% of South Africans had access to healthcare services, even though state healthcare services can be found even in the farthest corners of a country. Therefore, it is clear that the problem lies with service delivery and not accessibility with the people who are managing the service. Government is failing miserably in this regard. One of the main causes of this failure is the government's obsession with transformation. I've, st I've already stated this earlier this morning. And the ANC is transforming everything in, in the country into a mess. Seeing as the current system is not being managed properly, any dream of implementing another system is bound to turn into a nightmare. 
The NHI plan and bill, as I said, and I said it again, must be abolished at once because it's a recipe for disaster and it will not improve our hospitals and clinics. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chaperson. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Chaperson, is it it's me? It is you, yes. I'm going to repeat the order, honorable members, from here onwards. It's Gela, Clark, Siwela, Munyai, Harvard, Ismail, Tembukwayo. Dr. Jacobs, I'm just asking for, a, for a permission to, because my I have a lot shedding here. In it's good. You can go first, Honorable Gela. Just give an opportunity to Honorable Munya because of load shedding. Chair, I also have a load shedding, but I will give Honorable Munya. Can, can I request? Can I request to to switch off the video to save yes. the data? Fine, we have seen you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Can you hear me, Honorable Chair? Yes, I can. Thank you. We can. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, for the hard work to leave us to where we are now. Uh, and uh, uh, good morning, the honorable members. ANC rise to support clause 57, subsection 2A uh, from 1 to 4, with a proposed amendment for the following reason. Clause A must amend to read as follows that a uh, phase one for a period of five years from 2017 to 2023. Thank you very much. And also subsection one to four must be retained as they emphasize core areas of focus that must be undertaken by the department in preparing and finalizing applicable legislation as well as establishing the institution and structures that are enable the creation of the uh, functional NHI fund. Proposal for new sub clause for the establishment of the administrative capacity in the proposed for a fund and to read as follows. Please listen to me carefully. In, pre in preparation for the establishment of the fund as the Schedule 3A entity, contemplated in section nine, the minister must, in consultation with the Minister of Public Service and Administration, establish an appropriate administrative capacity to develop and, and prepare the function of the fund, functions of the fund. Honorable Chair, I also rise um, on behalf of the ANC to support clause 57, subsection 4G, for the following reason. It is important to note that, they, the, that whilst they, they, the cornerstone of moving towards a universal health coverage requires a strong primary health care approach, the higher levels of care are critical aspect of the comprehensiveness of service to be covered under the NHI and part of the referral process or system. The provision ensures that the fund puts into place mechanism that allow users to have access to uh, a continuum of care that incorporates services offered and also accessible at high levels of care from the public hospital and diagnostic platforms such as NHLS, enabling users to have access to the to such high levels of care will contribute towards the mitigating against cutters, cutters, uh, uh, trophic health related expenditure, which is key indicators of making progress towards universal health care coverage. The ANC also writes honorable chairperson to support clause 57, subject 5, for the following reason. The fund will, will be established as a, a Schedule A, Schedule 3A, non-business entity 
as per the provision of the PFMA. The state must ensure that any steps are taken towards creating a func functional structures of the fund are based on the principle that the fund is a primarily tax funded entity through a system that is mandatory and non-contributory. No user should ever be denied access to care because they are not able to make a payment or contribute to the fund. That is my last contribution, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Gela. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I rise in support of uh, Honorable Munyai's submission on clause 57. Um, Chairperson, I'm going to submit mine now. Um, ANC support uh, clause 57 1B for the following reasons. The, Facing of the implementation process and uh, basing this on financial resources uh, avail uh, availability is uh, consistent with the constitutional obligation placed on the uh, state uh, to progressively uh, release the population's health care needs within available resources as per the provision in the Bill of Rights. That will be my first submission, Chair. Uh, secondly, Chair, ANC support a uh, clause uh, 57.3a for the following reasons. The possible establishment of the National uh, Tertiary Health uh, Service Committee will be essentially for ensuring that provinces are engaged in the process of uh, uh, transitioning central hospitals into national uh, facilities, as well as ensuring that tertiary services are provided and governed in a, a consistent manner across the country. Uh, that will be my second uh, submission, Chair. I hope uh, it also addresses the concern of um, my colleagues uh, that have a concern. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, Chair, uh, ANC support uh, clause uh, 57.4a uh, for the following reasons. This clause uh, complement uh, clause 7.2f of the bill uh, to ensure that the services offered at a central hospital are made available nationally and not only uh, confined to provincial uh, jurisdictions. Secondly, uh, the clause also ensures that access uh, to tertiary and uh, continuary service is more equitable, including as training platforms for the healthcare professionals and centers of research, innovations, and excellence. Uh, thirdly, uh, Chem. Uh, this clause also uh, complements Section 41 of the National Health Act, which also provides for the central hospitals for the Minister of Health to determine the roles, function, and range of healthcare service that may be uh, provided by these central hospitals. My last submission, Chair, uh, on clause uh, 5740C. ANC support uh, this clause for the following reasons. Uh, the phased approach to the establishment of the NHI fund and its supporting governance structures is a key step to the realization of the purpose of the act. Secondly, ensuring that uh, the fund is uh, adequately capacitated with the functional a governance a structure to ensure a accountability of the fund. There will be no corruption, uh, Honorable Philip. I think it's also covering your concern. That will be my submission. Thank you, Chair. 
Kaut garantī, bet nemagēl, no? Thank you, Honorable Clark. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I'm not going to switch on my camera. I have a very low bandwidth and over and above that I have pink eyes, so I don't look great. Um, just um, in terms of my, my submissions. Um, Chairperson, just after this weekend, you know, um, I've never been so clear in my mind that um, our hospitals would never ever comply to what the rules and regulations in terms of specifications of the NHI um, certificate of standards compliance should reach. And that already is a clear indication after this weekend what our state hospitals um, are looking like. And you know, for, for, for healthcare to be improved in this country, we need to partnership with the private sector to ensure that we reach these outcomes. I mean, we just saw this weekend where the Clinton Foundation was involved. The difference between those wards and the rest of the wards, where the, and where there's been some collaboration between partnerships, the difference between the wards and the wards where they have no, where they've not been any collaboration, chairperson. And that's never been more clearer to me after this weekend. So the following input is uh, that I would like to give on section 57 is the implementation phases should not be defined based on fixed dates, but should be clarified through objective milestones, such as expansions of priority services towards the package of comprehensive health services, population coverage and reduction in out-of-pocket expenditure. So 1B, based on financial resource availability, yet there have been no feasible uh, financial or feasible feasibility studies done which have proven that there will be sufficient to prove that there will be sufficient resources to fund this. The minister must provide these before the bill should even be considered. The bill needs to be amended to take into account new timelines, as we've already reached um, the timeline of, timeline of phase one. The bill was also drafted prior to COVID-19, and frankly, the economic status prior to COVID-19 and now is incomparable if there were doubts about affordability in 27, 2018. It is certainly is far worse now and completely evident that South Africa cannot afford the NHI. There is no evidence to suggest it could even remotely achieve this goal. And we should be taking the funds and actually upgrading our healthcare facilities. I mean, Chairperson, you saw today, uh, this weekend, that if you go to one of our health facilities, you're lucky to, you know, um, uh, come out there alive. I mean, they, the prof was telling us that in the ICU neonatal, they have to tell parents to take their kids to general wards and prepare for the worst. I mean, how can we, that is, you know, incomprehensible, the, that kind of situation. And then number two, no financial or feasibility studies have been done to show whether NHI can be effective, effectively implemented in this time period without prejudicing quality health care. If there's even a doubt about the drop in quality of health care, the implementation of NHI can be deemed to be reckless and irrational, Chairperson. 2B2, mobilization of additional resources where necessary from where? Treasury already cannot afford to fund the NHI. The tax base will be insufficient to, and to adequately fund it. And where would these extra funds come from? This would need to be specifically included along with the list of other sources of income in section 49. Even if the bill were to pass, which the DA object, objects to, legislative reform should only be considered once the NHI fund is practically established and caution should be followed on liabilities being transferred to taxpayers during transition. 4E, how does the minister plan to register and certify healthcare providers when almost none of the public healthcare providers are able to meet the necessary standards of regis registration? 
And these clauses have already been objected to in various other sections of the bill. Um, and then, you know, um, Chairperson, in terms of, of the laws, um, you know, uh, uh, in section eight and uh, section H, you know, we need to follow process, Chairperson. I mean, if those acts are going to be changed, the process must be followed and stakeholders need to be giving input as well as for public um, comment. And it's really important that we repeal at this stage the, the timelines because these timelines were set in 2018. And, you know, um, even if it comes to the medical aids, um, the, they need to give written input in terms of these timelines. And if the state law advisors can actually um, advise us in writing, you know, in terms of the legal implications, um, um, uh, in terms of the material timelines, the additional comments from medical aids, because the timelines have shifted so much. And, you know, um, uh, we are, uh, I think it was mentioned, we're really concerned over the regulation of medical aids, um, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, I'm just going to well, um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, let me start by indicating my support for the contributions made by Honorable Munyai as well as Honorable Gela, and further indicates that the African National Congress support Clause 572B123 with proposed amendment for the following reasons. Clause B must be amended to read as follows. Phase two must be from 2023 to 2027 and be aligned with the progressive realization of the UHC goals and must include subclause uh, one to three uh, must be retained as they stipulate the need for continuity in preparatory work to be undertaken as the phase rollout expands, including the accreditation and contracting of targeted healthcare service providers. The additional resources to be mobilized will include funds in the conditional grants currently managed by the department. Furthermore, Chair, I also want to indicate that the African National Congress supports Clause 57.3c for the following reasons. This clause makes a provision for the minister to have the latitude and discretion to establish an interim advisory committee on healthcare benefits to strengthen the process of establishing uh, NHI. Lastly, Chairperson, I also want to indicate that the African National Congress support Clause um, 57 4D for the following reasons. A functional health patient registration system will bring to realization the objective of achieving universal healthcare coverage for all users by facilitating population coverage, especially in the form of access to quality and affordable healthcare. The information that will be made accessible via the HPRS is critical for supporting the funds planning, decision-making and resource allocation processes. The development of HPRS is fundamental to safeguarding the fund to have access to the necessary clinical and non-clinical information that will enable it to execute its strategic purchasing functions. The HPRS is also essential for the functioning of various technical and ministerial advisory committee of the fund. Without access to quality, timely and accurate information, these committees will not be able to, effect, to effectively support the functions and the activities of the fund. And so I submit, Chair. Uh, 
Thank you, Honorable Abbott. Okay. Th thank you, Honorable Chair. The, and the ANC's supporter clause 573 for the following reasons. These clauses make a provision for the minister to have the latitude and discretion to establish interim advisory com committees to strengthen the processes of establishing the NHI. Furthermore, ANC supports clause 574B for the following reasons. This, the establishment of contracting units of primary health care allows for the institutionalization of a key structure that would ensure the fund is capitated to execute its mandate functions and the responsibilities at the district sub-district level. Lastly, the CUPS are critical as a component of the NHI fund for contracting with primary health care service providers at the sub-district level. Lastly, I also rise to support the Honorable Gela, Honorable Moyai, and the Honorable Siwela's submission. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair, um, and good morning to everybody. I just have a few inputs, although I've been covered by Honorable Clark and Honorable Wilson. Uh, my first uh, input would be on Clause 572A. Now, 2017 has passed us already. There, there surely should be an amend amendment, you know, uh, with new timelines and timeframes with regard to the implementation of this. My second input is that if there is no amendments, uh, you know, we would please like the legal advisors to advise on this because surely legislation does not apply, you know, retrospectively. And is this even allowed? You know, my colleague spoke about uh, new feasibility studies um, considering the amount that we're looking at with regard to the NHI fund. I think it is essential that, you know, appropriate uh, current feasibility studies are actually done. Uh, because we are looking at a feasibility study that was done, you know, way before COVID and obviously the uh, current uh, fiscus of the economy is obviously much, much different or in a different state right now. And on clause 57, section three, again, um, the minister may establish interim committees, but there are no specific criteria stated on how these committees will be established composition of these committees, criterion for, you know, these committees, basically criterion for members to be elected, disqualifications of members, remuneration, if any, terms of office and, uh, you know, uh, quorum as well as the amount of members allowed, just as we specified previously, you know, uh, with regard to other committees in the bill, all this must be stated in the section as health committees are statutory structures and uh, all this should be specifically included you know, on in this bill. On clause 57, section 4F, um, it does not include mental health care workers like psychologists, you know, physiologists, social workers, uh, among health care workers mentioned for the provision of primary health care services. Will these be included? If not, how are they going to be accommodated? You know, I'm really concerned by saying, you know, using current uh, resources uh, you know, where, where, where this, this bill can be actually implemented using current resources. The fact of the matter is our current healthcare system is already under so much stress. Uh, we have a fragmented healthcare system. It's really unrealistic. It's totally illogical to be putting more pressure on the current healthcare system uh, when we know, you know, I mean, you guys just went to the Eastern Cape and you saw the state of it there. Uh, and uh, many of the other provinces are obviously in a bad state. The H report has stated clearly that uh, it's only the Western Cape that is functioning optimally. Other than that, we've got issues everywhere. The health ombudsman has stated clearly that it's uh, with the current status of our health, uh, public health care system, you know, NHI is going to be very difficult to be implemented. Um, another issue on clause 57, again, there is no clarity on the role of the provincial departments uh, uh, of health under the NHI. Now this move re basically requires an amendment to the constitution itself. 
And um, obviously this, this really uh, states that, you know, this whole NHI fund is actually unconstitutional. Uh, also the move of central and tertiary hospitals from provinces to the national government, as well as their specific roles, uh, you know, with regard to academia, you know, academia, including research and training. Now, all this is really worrisome is moving, you know, of employment also has low implications and research and training will be affected as now products available at provincial level may actually not be the same as at national level. Thank you, Chair. I'll stop there. Thank you. Honorable Tim Bakwayo, are you on the platform or should I read your message? Honorable Tim Bakwayo. I'm going to read um, the input of Honorable Tim Bakwayo. Doesn't seem like she is on the platform now. Uh, the clause by clause engagement as it is happening now does not serve any values as the status of the hospitals, especially the infrastructure problem is not solved. And that has been strengthened by our weekend visit to Eastern Cape. It is advisable to pause the process and revisit the situation on an urgent basis. No public hospital is ready to implement NHI. EFF rejects the flaws under discussion, including the remaining ones. We now heard the input of uh, Honorable Dr. Timbo Kwayo. Uh, Honorable Monyai, is that your previous hand or do you have a new hand raised there before no, I continue? It is something that I just omitted, Honorable Chair, if you can allow me. Yes, Honorable. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Honorable Chairperson. The ANC fully support clause 57. It is important that the timelines are clearly articulated as defined a milestone link to the time. Should this not be done, the transformation of the health system will be held to ransom. And, uh, and by those who do not uh, subscribe to the transformation of the socio-economic environment of South Africa. By the way, the timelines will ensure that all of us in society are rallied around the common goal. We as the ANC are satisfied that there is enough funding in the healthcare sector as we spend 8.7 percent of, of our GDP on health. So what we mean by this honorable chair is that we must improve the efficiency of the spending as a one country, not multiple countries in one countries. We are one nation in one countries. NHI is an equalizer and will really redirect resources to strengthen those facilities that are country under under resourced, both in terms of financial resource and human resource. I want to also to indicate, by the way, Chairperson, we are not a federal state; we are a unitary government. So, therefore, Honourable Chairperson, this issue that of the this particular clause that we are trying to advance is try to equalize, as I said, because currently we have two tier system. We can't allow that situation to happen. We have to transform. By the way, the UK, when they introduced the NHLS, they just came from the World War. They didn't have the money. So therefore, the issue of the money will not rise, Honorable Chairperson. I must clarify, during the oversight, Honorable Ishmael was not part of that. So she can't speak of the area where she didn't see. Thank On you. Point of order, Chief. Point of order. Uh... Honorable Ismail. Thank you, Chair. I think Honorable Munyai has not heard me correct. I said when our colleagues attended the Eastern Cape oversight, I've obviously seen the report back. Thank you, Chair. I think we shouldn't be playing politics. This is a very important matter we're discussing. Thank you, Honorable Munyai. No, no, no. I'm covered, Honorable Chair. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. 
Thank you, honorable members. I'm going to give my uh, inputs also. Firstly, on uh, 57.1a, which the ANC supports, because the implementation of NHI requires an intense period of ongoing legislative and policy reforms as part of the preparatory work to create the institutional and organizational structures required to make the successful and sustainable implementation of the NHI fund. Adopting a phased and structured process allows for the state and stakeholders to learn lessons and improve systems and processes as the phased implementation agenda proceeds. On clause 57.3b, which the ANC supports, this clause makes a provision for the minister to have the latitude and discretion to establish interim advisory committees related to the national governing body on training and development to strengthen the processes of establishing the NHI. The creation of the National Governing Body on Training and Development creates me mechanisms for the translation into action of the plans and deliverables indicated in the 2030 Human Resources for Health Strategy. Subclauses one to four must be re retained as they provide the details with regards to elements that must be actively pursued and considered by the national governing body on training and development in contributing to the coordination and alignment of the training, development, and financing strategy for the country's health sciences education, as well as any platform for training. The ANC supports clause 57.3D for the following reasons. This clause makes a provision for the minister to have the latitude and discretion to establish advisory committee on health technology assessment to strengthen the processes of establishing the NHI. Health technology assessment is an important element to be undertaken as part of the processes for deciding and informing the scope of healthcare benefits and associated technologies that must be included in the formulary and essential equipment list that users are entitled to. Health technology assessment is also critical for determining the most affordable technology, using evidence-based medicine principles, which must be accessible to all users of quality healthcare services. In broader terms, instituting mechanisms that entrench health technology assessment is pivotal for ensuring that the fund is sustainable. ANC supports also clause 57.4e for the following reasons that the sequential processes for accreditation requires that the fund must take into account the information emanating from the inspection and certification processes that are implemented by the Office of Health Standards Compliance for all types of health establishments and healthcare service providers, as well as the registration and licensing of health professionals by the statutory regulatory councils. This will ensure a seamless and interrelated regime that is based on consistent criteria for accrediting and contracted providers of healthcare services to users. This is also an important aspect of quality assurance for providers of healthcare services and part of strategic purchasing. The ANC also supports clause 57.4F, and we propose some minor changes for the following reasons. The range of services to be included for prioritization must include mental health care services. This provision is otherwise consistent with the requirement of ensuring that the fund covers a comprehensive and quantum of care that ranges from primary health care services all the way to the most specialized care that will be required by others, by users. Prioritizing purchasing of primary health care services, maternity and child health care services, and services for vulnerable communities, such as those for older persons, persons with disabilities, and rural communities. 
It is the cornerstone of ensuring that equity and justice are realized. This is also the most cost-effective way of improving access. The processes for setting up the structures and mechanisms for purchasing required services from health establishments and healthcare providers must be premised on ensuring that we move forward and towards universal health care coverage. The process must also ensure that no one is left behind and that all users have fair and equitable chance of access to a reasonable scope of services that effectively address their personal health care needs. We also, as the ANC support clause 574H1 to 11, for the following reasons. The acts indicated here are a summary of those that will require consequential amendments to support the creation of the legislative and the regulatory framework for the phased implementation of NHI. Additionally, the indicated acts would need to be amended to allow for the operationalization of the various structures required to create a functional, effective, and sustainable NHI fund. These laws will be considered further during the debate in section 38 on schedules that deals with repeal and amendment of legislation affected by this act. Those honorable members. Those honorable members. Um, just an, an additional input is that uh, staff pensions must be protected during the transition for noting when they migrate from NDOH to the NHI fund. This must also include assets as an additional proposal. So those are the uh, inputs, Honorable Munya. You know, those are the inputs. No, no, I, I rise to support your input and all other input by Honorable AIMS and members. Thank you. Thank you. And I also will send a written the... report. Sorry? Send the ANC position on all the contribution you have made. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable members, that also serves as a reminder that you have to forward any recommendations which you'd want to make to the secretary of the portfolio committee. I am reminding you again of that uh, responsibility which you have. Honorable Clark. Thank you, Chairperson. I mean, I just wanted to find out, I've got my recommendations, but surely the meeting is recorded and all the recommendations is on that recording as we've deliberated on the bill. Thank you. Honorable Clark, that was not the arrangement. Do you really think everybody's going to go and listen to these recordings to try and get now an understanding of the recommendation? There was a decision taken by us that all political parties will forward their, their uh, recommendations to the committee secretary. Please remember that there will be a process where I will be asking for those recommendations in the portfolio committee on, uh, on health. It will probably be about the second or third meeting from here onwards. Uh, I'm going to take the following hands, Honorable Van Staden, and Honorable Thank you, Chair. Now, I just wanted to get clarity and ask if, there's, if we can get a set date when this must be submitted to, to the committee clerk, please. Honorable Munye. Thank you very much. I remember vividly, Honorable Chair, that uh, from the start, you ask all of us and you repeatedly during the process that the honorable members must send their submission to honor, to the sec committee secretary, uh, Ms. Majalamba. So that that is on record many a time. You're on record many a times from the beginning until the end, you are reminding us. Thank you very much. So therefore, accordingly, I will send mine on behalf of the ANC to secretary. Thank you, Honorable Isma. Thank you, Chair. I just have two points that I would like to raise. One is that um, while you're asking us for our inputs, all said and done, I just want to ask, and I want you to put it on record, 
and Julie monitored that we've been requesting as the DA for the feasibility studies to confirm, you know, the amount of funds within the NHI. Please, can you advise when is that going to be provided to us? That's one. Secondly, is that um, obviously before this bill is officially passed and so forth, we're expecting the legal advisors to come back to us to give us clarity on the inputs that we've been made, uh, you know, in the, in the various clauses. And obviously the department and the legal advisors to come back to us on our inputs to say um, where we stand with certain issues. Uh, when will this be done as well, Chair? Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. Uh, your inputs are noted. I think some of you are jumping the gun a little bit uh, because at the end of this meeting, I'm going to try and give you some indications on the processes going forward. Of course, we'll not be able to give you set dates because these processes follow one after the other. And so some are determined by the processes going before whether uh, we'd be able to sit successfully. But at least you'd have an idea of the processes which should be followed after this, so that none of you think that the next stage is the voting on the bill, uh, as is, for example, next week or so. You, you will be, I will be giving you an input uh, at the end of the deliberations on these clauses. So, uh, Munyai, I hope that is the previous hand. No, it is a legacy hand. Remember, you, you know, you clarified to us that on the process in the beginning, that before the bill comes here, the ministry makes sure that the legal advisor is involved and the issue certificate, the economics and feasibility is done at that level. And therefore, then it comes to parliament. You clarify those issues before us long, long time ago. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable members, I'm being very fair and very kind and very courteous to all of you. I constantly remind you as we go along. The whole intention is to make certain that we follow due process and that we not find wanting on the process as a portfolio committee. Therefore, there are things which have been agreed to before. One is, for example, that you must for official recording purposes, forward your submissions on any recommendations or any proposals to the Secretary of the Portfolio Committee on Health. I think this is probably the last time that I'm going to, re to, uh, to remind you because we're now coming to the closure and there wouldn't maybe be another opportunity. Secondly, it was a, agreed in a meeting that the department will respond to these, to the, to the clauses, to the bill after uh, we had completed the clause by clause deliberations. We're going to complete the clauses in the next 30 minutes, I would think. Then it would be next week, the department's uh, opportunity to come and take us through the, uh, the schedule and then to also give us the responses of the department to the de deliberations which we've had on the clauses. So I'm not going to take any hands now. I, I need to go to clause 58 so that we can complete what we are busy with. So clause 58 has, is headed repeal or amendment of laws. Subject to this section and section 57 dealing with transitional arrangement, the laws mentioned in the second column of the schedule are hereby repealed or amended to the extent set out in the third column of the schedule. The repeal or amendment of any law by this act does not affect the previous operation of such law or anything done or permitted under such law. Any right privilege obligation or liability acquired, accrued or incurred under such law or any pen penalty, forfeiture or punishment incurred in respect of any offense committed in terms of such law. I will now take your hands, honorable members. Ismail. Munyai, Lark, and 
any other hands? Ismail Bunyai Clark in that order. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're discussing clause 58. Under Medical Schemes Act, um, it does not state as to you know, what is actually meant by uh, top up cover in clause four under that section. You know, specifics need to be stated in as well in this section as well. Uh, on uh, my second input on the National Health Act, um, does clause one include hospitals? Clause three is a problem as it takes away this, the functions of provinces, which is obviously unconstitutional. Um, also, I need some clarity, you know, when looking at clause uh, 10.1b in this bill and under the National Health Act in this section, uh, clause six, is this not duplicating the function by the District Health uh, Management Office? Uh, the bill proposes major changes to other pieces of legislation, which will obviously, one, remove the responsibility of employers to cover the healthcare costs of workers injured on duty. Now, this will effectively change the pricing of medicines and medical uh, you know, devices and in vitro diagnostics. It will make significant changes to the National Health Act, which will affect the delivery functions of healthcare. It will change the current provincial systems at, uh, to you know, district management systems. There is no uh, very clear, there's basically there's no clarity. There's no clear replacement of the two systems. These need to be specified um, and clarified because the implications of these, you know, uh, of these repeals and amendments are not adequately clarified, uh, explained or specified for, you know, for understanding. Uh, that's all my input. Thank you, Chair. Uh, may I proceed, Honorable Chair? Please do. Thank you very much for this opportunity. The ANC rise to support clause 58 subsection 2C for the following reason. This provision ensures legislative and regulatory integration and ensures that the gaps are adversely created in the legal framework as a result of the enactment of the NHI. Where a user or other such as the party is liable for any other penal any penalty for failure or punishment in respect of the offense committed in terms of the of any of any other law affected by this act the enactment of this act should not automatically exempt them from such i further honorable chairperson uh, Raise, raise, uh, raise my hand to support uh, uh, clause 591 for the following reason. Once the bill has been de uh, debated, it is standard Honorable, practice. Honorable Munya, we are on clause 58. Th thank you very much. Are you done, Honorable Munyai? Thank you, Honorable Clark. Person, I wanted to clarify issue. The issue of the two tier system is a fact. And we must really, uh, I know there's a lot of propaganda, barrage of propaganda that the bill is unconstitutional. And how can it be unconstitutional uh, uh, to serve and equalize the healthcare systems. How can it be equalized when the constitution speak of saving the life of our people through this intervention? Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Clark. Um, thank you, Chairperson. I'm sure the court will make a decision whether this bill is constitutional or not. Um, I just wanted to raise that the Concommitment legislation that is amended by the bill should be reflected in schedule to the A-list, but if amendments were made to the bill as tabled there, it should also be in a B-list, which reflects those. And um, I would just like to find out um, if the state law advisors are going to bring those um, processes back to us for discussion. 
Um, and also, I once again raise that the material timelines of the medical aid, um, in terms of the Medical AIDS Act, also needs to take, be taken into cognizance because, um, you know, all the timelines have now shifted in terms of this bill. And in terms of legal processes, how would that be dealt with? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Gela. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chairperson, firstly, I rise in support of Honorable Munyai's submissions and also coming to my submission on this clause, Chair. Uh, ANC support clause 58 uh, 2B for the following reasons. This provision is consistent with the Constitution in that it is uh, premised uh, on the expectation that no users right or privileges uh, undermined or eroded as um, consequences of the of the an act uh, of an enactment of the bill that will be my submission chair thank you very much the ANC also supports clause 58 1 2a for the following reason that the provision ensures legislative and regulatory integration and ensures that no gaps are inadvertently created in the legal framework as a result of the enactment of the NHI Act. Honorable members, I'm going on to clause 59. It is uh, titled Short Title and Commencement. This act is called the National Health Insurance Act 2019 and takes effect on a date fixed by the president by proclamation in the government gazette. Subject to section 57, different dates may be fixed in respect of the coming um, into effect of different provisions of this act. I will now take hands, honorable members. Honorable Van Staden. Siwela, Clark, Munye, and let me just see if I can see that one. Uh, so it is Van Staden, Siwela, Clark, Munye, Ismail, Bela. Honorable members, I'm going to say again to you, I see I still have to release you and call you every time. I don't think it is fair. Please keep your attention to this process. When it's your turn, start speaking. It's Van Staden, Siwela, Clark, Bunya, Ismail, Gela. Thank you in that order. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Chairperson, we have become at the end of the deliberating of this bill. And the past weeks, it is abundantly clear that the NHI bill cannot be implemented and that it is not the right nor the correct, correct way to provide healthcare services to nearly the 58 million South Africans. A plan for the healthcare system, which incorporates both the private healthcare sector and the public healthcare sector, must be developed to ensure that all the medical professionals across South Africa work together to put such a system in place. It is not the government's responsibility to develop such a system. It is the responsibility of all medical professionals who work extremely hard every day to keep South Africans healthy. Our country needs a system developed by medical experts and not politicians, nor government officials. A system that does not aim to destroy the one sector for the sake of the other, a system where politicians listen to the ideas of medical professionals in the private and public healthcare sectors and the system designed by medical practitioners and passed as law by us as members of parliament. Therefore, the Freedom Front Plus rejects this bill, the National Health Insurance Bill, in its entirety. Thank you, Chairperson.
Honorable Siwela. Oh, I think we've lost Honorable Siwela from the platform. He'll probably join again. Honorable Clark. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, just to uh, the position of the DA, um, we find that this bill has huge infringement on people's rights in order to um, acquire medical treatment and that this government should put in a plan and develop a system how universal health care can actually be, be bettered because we do have uni universal health care in this country, but the environment we operate in is just too terrible and there must be some system that can correct that. By um, implementing the NHI bill, we believe that this is not going to reach those outcomes. We believe that private partnerships should be created between the state and the private sector, and um, also through the guidance of medical professions that uh, medical professionals that can give us the proper guidance as to uh, as to um, increase the, the 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 betterment of the environment state hospitals functioning. We also, also believe that the OHSC and the Ombudsman should be um, part of that um, um, uh, uh, system that should be developed and, and they should remain as independent. And therefore we believe that this bill will not reach um, uh, uh, what we should achieve in terms of universal healthcare as the DA. And therefore we do not support this bill in its entirety. Thank you. Honorable Monia. You, Honorable Che. No, no, I'm here, Honorable Che. I want to firstly rise to support Clause 591 for the following reason. Uh, once the bill has been debated, it is a standard practice for the president to proclaim it through a gazette as the way that will govern the implementation of the NHI. And I must say, Honorable Chairperson, I must thank you for the guidance until to this level of really concluding the, uh, the clause by clause. I know that the, the, the journey is not over, but one critical thing that I want to raise, this bill will pass the constitutional master because it's trying to reverse the, the apartheid two-tier system that segregated uh, our people, one being that of medical aid schemes and one that will be that of the public services. We know, Chairperson, this bill is trying to resolve the inequality. This bill is trying to resolve the challenges raised by the health market inquiry. And therefore, I'm proudly uh, believe that this bill should be implemented as a practical and urgent as possible because it will change the quality of healthcare to all South Africans, regardless of the rich funded by medical aid and the poor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to state categorically that as a DA, we totally support universal healthcare. However, it must be stated unequivocally that presently the country does not have the capacity, political stability, management skills, and capability to effectively provide quality healthcare to the country. This most especially in light of failed pilot projects that cost taxpayers to the tune of five billion rand. This report, you know, the, this report showing that the department did not have measurable targets, doctors were not paid on time, medication shortages, infrastructure that has been failing communities, critical skill shortages, and high vacancy rates. We also need to remember that at every public hearing, every submission stated clearly that while the NHI seems to be a noble cause, the current healthcare system failures need to be fixed and addressed first. Healthcare professionals stated clearly that they took a hypocritical oath and the NHI, the NHI will not allow them to effectively honor the oath under the current bill and fragmented failures 
of our current healthcare system. Further to this submission, uh, stated clearly that corruption is rife in departments and the minister has way too much power in this bill, uh, thus allowing too much political interference and, an, and, and uh, you know, a further avenue for corruption. In, in addition to this, the bill requires a capable state, which the country presently does not have the ability to bring such reform. The NHI bill in its current form needs much improvement, new financial and feasibility studies need to be done, and the NHI bill in its current form is unconstitutional and therefore not supported. I'm fully covered by Honorable Clark, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, let me uh, firstly um, support Honorable Munyai on his submission in clause 59 and also his input. I think, Chair, as South Africans, we are ready. Uh, we are ready for NHI. Despite of the issues that the opposition party they are raising, because they are covered, they know they have a better uh, healthcare system in their uh, private sector. They are not attending the public sector. So this bill is going to make sure that we equalize uh, the system, the two-tier two system that Honorable Munyai has mentioned. So Chair, I think this is the right move um, and we went to public hearing where South Africans have said, have given us as politicians a mandate to make sure that we carry and we implement that mandate of saying they want NHI. We have seen labors, we have seen all structures uh, besides few uh, minority people who are against the NHI, but the voice of the people, the majority have said, Chairperson, we must, as politicians, listen to the people who have put us on power to make sure that uh, we implement the decision that they've said we must implement. Because honestly, Chair, when you go to private sector, if you don't have a medical aid, if you don't have money, you can't be treated. So even those who have a medical aid, when their medical aid is exhausted, they refer them to the public uh, hospitals. So Chairperson, I think as South Africa, we are ready for NHI. And I must also thank you for your effort and the good work that you have done to push uh, this uh, bill until so far, we are ready Chairperson. Of course, we know that opposition parties, they will never support NHI because they know actually uh, they, are not, they are not here for the, 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 the needs of the people. They are here to fight whatever that uh, it's coming uh, to make sure that we, we, we make the on a, point of, of, on a point of order, Chair. Of the, we make the life of a, a South African a better, Chair. So in short, Chair, on as a, I'm closing. On a point Honorable of order, Gela. Chair. Honorable Gela, let me take the point of order, please. I Honourable authorize Wilson. the point, Chair. Yeah, Honourable Wilson. Order, please, Chair, my hands up. Wilson, uh, let me start. Ismail Wilson Clark. I'll come back mm -hmm. to you, Honourable Gela. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just arise on a point of order on what Honourable Gela stated right now. Honorable Gela stated that um, we as opposition parties don't care for the people. I think Honorable Gela needs to withdraw this unequivocally um, because we are all here as mandated by the amount of votes that we have. We are all here that are listening to the to the to the submissions of the inputs of, of, of the public Order. and institutions. Order I find check. this highly, I find this highly uh, incorrect. Order. Order. Honorable Order. Gela Order. over Order. and over again says the very same things and nothing is being done about it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Yes, and I agree with the Honorable Ishmael. The Honorable Gela must withdraw the fact that she has said that we don't care for the people of South Africa. I took an oath when I came into this parliament, and that oath was to protect the constitution and to protect all people of South Africa. It is an oath that I swore to God that I take very, very seriously, and she has no right to say what she did. She is out of line. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. But block. Thank you, Chairperson. I concur. Honorable Geller must withdraw that um, statement, Chair. 
We are all here as elected representatives, as, as a member Wilson said, we took an oath to protect the constitution and serve the people of South Africa. And she cannot stand up and say that we don't care for the people in this country. She has no right to do that. Thank you, Honorable Bunyai. Chairperson, the way I heard Honorable Geller, she said uh, the opposition does not care as much as she do. That's how I understood it. Otherwise, you might check it on the unsigned chair. Please do. She's a chair. On honorable members, Honorable Ismail Wilson, and I've given you an opportunity. It's now my opportunity. Your points of order has nothing to do with process in terms of a point of order. Those are not really points of order. But I've given an opportunity to at least voice what you wanted to voice. I do not think that there is a need for Honorable Gela to withdraw because nothing that she has said is, is not allowed in terms of the rules. So honorable members, I'm now going to say my part on section uh, on clause 59, one. Chair, you've allowed her to make an assumption which is incorrect. It is not an assumption. She made a statement, uh, honorable, um, uh, honorable uh, Ismail. Even worse. A statement is even worse than an assumption, Chair. But she's made an estate. Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to go back to her also before I continue. Honorable Gela, uh, can you just say what you had said so that I can hear whether that is anything you need to withdraw, please? Uh, Chair, uh, there's nothing that I must withdraw, Chair, uh, from what I've said, Chair. I think we are all here to make sure that uh, we serve the interest of uh, the people of South Africa. And Chepesin, NHI is the only way to make sure that we correct the imbalance and make sure that every citizen has a right and also get a, a treatment, a good treatment uh, in terms of health, uh, a, a sector. So we want to lead a healthy uh, society. We want to have a Chaperson equally health a system, uh, whether you are poor or rich. So Chaperson, I really appreciate the opportunity that you have given us as portfolio committee members uh, to deliberate clause by clause and to make sure that today is the final day of us and also making sure that we are looking forward uh, to make sure that we pass this bill so that every citizen okay, will get Thank you, Chair. Point was raised on the point of order. Honorable Siwela. <clears throat> Chairperson, thank you very much for the opportunity. Of course, um, I was to indicate that I support the contribution made by Honorable Minyai, and that as the African National Congress, we are looking forward to the president signing off this bill once it is done. We want to do away with the two-tier system. It is not desirable. And the opposition myself has achieved that instead of telling us that this bill is unconstitutional. Thank you, sir. Okay, honorable members, uh, let me also remind you that this is not the last day. You're putting up a battle as if this is the end of everything. We're still going to be around here for a number of weeks, just to remind you that uh, this is not the last day uh, of the of deliberations on the bill. So in terms of uh, my input, um, section uh, clause 59.1 to the ANC supports is because once the bill has been debated, it is standard practice for the president to proclaim it through the Z as the law that will govern the implementation of the NHI. Now we've had many reasons 
throughout, starting with the bill itself, then the public hearings, provincial public hearings, the submissions which were made by your email, hard copies, etc. What the poor people of South Africa really thought about the bill. And um, we've come to the point, a, a particular phase of this work now, which is only the part of having passed uh, these public hearings process and now this clause by clause deliberations. I need to remind you of the work that will be uh, that we will be doing as we will be going forward. So that, uh, and, and, I'd, and I would really hope you are actually going to note this so that we don't have to repeat these things uh, as on the, some honorable members tend to do. The first part would be the fact that we have to engage on the schedule of the bill. It is when the department will come and they will give us, they, it is actually the department's duty to take us through that schedule. The amendments as we're calling it to the, to the acts and those are, uh, uh, are 11 acts for which uh, we need to have the, the acts and it's going to be a physical meeting just to inform you and I need to inform you of the following while we're talking about it. There are not going to be no more, virt uh, no more hybrid meetings. There has been a writing by the chair of chairs that these virtual meetings, these hybrid meetings are very expensive. The meetings would either be virtual as the one we're having now, or it's going to be physical. So all of you from next week onwards, all of the following deliberations on this bill will be physical. Please make plans to be, as from next week, be in Cape Town for these meetings. So the first one is the one that I've just finished, the deliberations on the, or the amendments to the acts. The second one is that the department and the minister will come to give their responses to what has been raised uh, in the public hearings on the close by close deliberations, etc. Because that's the next process before we can go to the following process. Or the following process might even come before that then. But the, fo the one following would be your inputs from yourselves as political parties, which I'm going to reiterate has to be in the written format. And then we're going to look at the inputs of the public hearings. We are in the process of developing a matrix for that, so that we've also look at what has been raised. In terms of the process, we need to do that. The, the uh, work following will be um, inputs from the state law advisor and the legal services of parliament. After that, honorable members, we will have to adopt the committee report. Then only we look at uh, this B bill, the, the A list and the B bill. In other words, we will then see where, where the B, sorry, then the B bill, and we then only uh, discuss the potential B bill. Then only we go for adoption by the NAC. National Assembly. So there's a lot of work still ahead. Um, we will commence next week. There is a probability that if we do not agree or if we do not finish by the time that Parliament rises, that we're going to, going to be the only committee that will still be having one or two days of meetings after Parliament rises in December. So we would have to move with speed because there's another bill that we think will probably come to the portfolio committee on health, and that is uh, in inverted commas, the uh, tobacco bill. We wouldn't want to be caught with two days. Having said that now, honorable members, I'm going to give the opportunity by even look back for my two days. Honorable Clark. Um, thank you, Chairperson. I would also recommend that, that we actually, if, if we don't finish, um, we need to then have more meetings than one meeting a week because a lot of people have made arrangements to go away on their annual holidays, Chair. And um, uh, and also the, the last, the, the week following after we rise, a lot of us have made arrangements 
arrangements in our constituencies as well to do constituency work. And um, you know, we also can't have this process infringing on the on our responsibilities in terms of our constituency. So I suggest we would do that. Thank you. Thank you. No other inputs. Thank you, honorable members. Honorable members, I agree with honorable clerk. So we normally apply for, for these meetings. We will apply for more meetings too, to the uh, the chair of chairs, and hopefully we get um, it being agreed to that we'll we'll try to have uh, meetings even after plenaries in the evenings, so that we are able to finish our work. We are then looking forward to the department next week, um, and and again I'm going to say that you need to be all be all all of you need to be there physically, and we're going to print the these. Um, these uh, um, acts for you. We're going to sit there, we're going to go through it, and uh, I'd expect you to read up ahead on these so that we are able to expedite the work. Thank you, honorable members, for your time. Today, all those who have come to attend our meeting, we've come to the end of this meeting. Uh, just to remind us, uh, earlier I did uh, indicate that uh, Mr. Theo Hercules of the State law advisor was in the meeting. He joined not too not too too late after uh, soon after we had started our meeting. So uh, this meeting is therefore adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.